sin señal. Muy buenos días a todos mis amigos de Santa Cruz County Public Media. Estamos aquí en TEP, en las instalaciones de TEP, en un evento fantástico. Se llama Diplomacy and Leadership Summit. Si no se acuerdan, hicimos una entrevista con las personas que trajeron este Leadership Summit aquí en Tucson y Ahorita, en este momento, vamos a entrar a la cámara para que vean la programación en vivo, pero con nosotros nos acompaña el señor mayor uh, Jorge Maldonado, quien va a recibir una medalla hoy en la noche por su trayectoria y su trabajo en su comunidad. También está con nosotros Mr. Young, uh, Chris Young, um, Chief de uh, Superintendent's um, Office. Um, nos va a acompañar en la mesa. Está Santa Cruz County Public Media. Nosotros de, 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 de síguenos por el programa de Willow Nogales. Y um, está con nosotros también uh, representando Nogales Fire Department, uh, José Higuera. Y si nos quieren acompañar adentro, les vamos a enseñar. Vamos a estar todo el día aquí de hoy y mañana. Vamos a estar conectando con personas de México, de diferentes partes del mundo, trayendo la campana um, de una celebración de, de la campana por, por una fundación que consolida el trabajo entre Estados Unidos y México. Tienen que escuchar la historia y la vamos a escuchar pronto durante unas entrevistas, pero acompáñenos adentro a escuchar um, la inauguración y de aquí a um, si quieren escuchar lo que tiene para, para nosotros el Diplomacy en, en Leadership Summit y más adelante con las entrevistas. Muchas gracias y nos vemos pronto. And that's how we became involved with the public sector and the local government. So it is great, and I am loving it. I feel and very thankful of Umberto Stevens for inviting me to this committee, as well as Genoveva. They have been such great mentors throughout this journey. But the reason that we're here today is because the Diplomacy and Leadership Summit is honored to collaborate with the Campana Libertad Tucson Committee. I'm its benefactor, the Fundación Honoris Causa, which, thank you, thank you all for being here. <laughs> the Fundación Honoris Causa, in conjunction with the Consejo de Comunidades Hispanas, Council of Hispanic Communities, we are here to strengthen, innovate, and expand financial diplomacy, community, and commerce. We're also gathered here today uh, in honor of the United States Ambassador to Mexico, Ken Salazar, and his initiative to celebrate the commemoration of the 200th anniversary of diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Mexico. In the evening, we will also be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Tucson Guadalajara Sister City Partnership and the unveiling of the Campana Libertad Award that was given to the city of Tucson. And with that being said, I do want to introduce you to Humberto Stevens, which is the co-chairperson of the Campana Libertad and Funcion, Fundación Honoris Causa Internacional de Tucson, and chairman of the Diplomacy and Leadership Summit up here to the stage. Good morning, buenos días, bienvenidos. I, I'm, I'm and the committee are very appreciative of you attending this morning, or good morning. Uh, for those of you that are uh, costeños, sorry for the cold morning. It's, it's very different. We have, we have Florida represented as well. We have many states here. So uh, show of hands for those that are from out of state today. Thank you very much. Out of, out of the country, out of the region. All right. So I want to welcome everyone today. It's been a, a Long road on a fast trip of four months instead of a year to build this. But when we got together, Genoveva, Este Dios was kind enough to approach me, and then Fundación Consejos. We got together and said, what do we want to do? I said, let me say yes before you even finish the, answer, uh, the question. I want to help with this. This is something that we need for our community, for our region. You know, we've been through a pandemic, We've been through so many economic issues that are happening, but when groups like this get together, it's an opportunity to come together and do something different. For diplomacy, 
for our communities, but also for commerce, because I say over and over, one cannot subsist without the other. It's an integral part of our lives. I look at this table here, where we have the represented University of Arizona, Secretary of Foreign Affairs for Mexico. And that's what it's about. I see bankers, I see mayors, I see corporate leaders, I see nonprofit leaders provide medical services, health and wellness. Thank you, Brenda, for everything you do. And I see foundation leaders too. I see people from, if we look at Arizona, from the border, from Nogales, my hometown. Thank you, Mayor Maldonado, and invited guests for coming today, including some of the media. It's dear and dear to my heart, this project, because it represents two parts of my life. I've spent my life in Mexico and the U.S. for my entire career, doing many things. Some of you remember fax machines, right? Remember the little things that hold that paper? In, in 1993, I was faxing my homework from Mexico up in the hills in my first international project when I was still at the University of Arizona. Yes, you guys docked me one grade because I wasn't in <laughs> class to take the test. But the point being, it gave me a, a very, very deep insight to Mexico. I've been mean, working from in banking, working in logistics, transportation, I learned a lot of things. But the one thing I learned is that it took those three areas, diplomacy, community, and commerce. Right, when we work with US Customs, Mexican Customs, Immigration, Logistics, it took all these parts to make things happen. You know, bridges were built, dams were built, roads were built, multi-billion dollar investments, and they're gonna to continue to grow if groups like ours get together and support that, educating business leaders, community leaders, about what needs to happen. And that's an important part of what we do. But I always say, this Diplomacy and Leadership Summit, it's just, a, it's a ship. It's an anabe that's taking us somewhere. And the shining star that leads us to where we need to go is the Campana de Libertad de Tuzón. That's why all this is happening. That's, and, and it's an integral part of what we're doing. And from this, we're going to have action items. We're going to have actual reports that report. But what are we doing? We're not just meeting here, shake hands, have photo ops. Many of you wouldn't come for that. We're here to build something, action items, and report out on it. Whether it be education, whether it be university agreements in education, whether it be diplomas, whether it be scholarships, whether it be new commercial hacks. We don't know what's going to happen, but from today's meetings, from the breakout sessions, the fireside chat, we're going to find out more. And mind you, again, there are action items that are come out, they're going to come out of this. That's the whole point of getting together today, besides the camaraderie that we built. So I don't want to take more of your time. Muchas gracias to everyone that works so hard, the committees, day and night. We've got our ups and downs, but that's what happens when you're in a super race like, like we have to put this event on for our community. At large, yes, the bell for the city of Tucson, for the community of Tucson. But as we know, it, it can travel. And thank you, Mayor Maldonado, for having the bell in Nogales soon. <coughs> Consul here as well. And it will travel around to signify these three things and the love we have for our communities. So without further ado, again, thank you to the community. Thank you for you, for you that are here today. And those that could not make it, I understand as well, are here in spirit. So I applaud you, and thank you very much. She is also uh, the co-chair of the Campana Libertad Committee and the Fundación Honoris Causa Internacional de Tucson. However, she is right now on duty. She went to Phoenix to go and pick up a few of her members that are also going to be attending the summit. And hopefully, well, the whole dinner, hopefully, is part of the summit. Because I'm sure that there are going to be great conversations going on this morning. And it's something that you do not want to miss. But with any further ado, I do want to mention that we have a lovely person here today that is going to be our keynote for today for the summit. He has worn many hats, not only at the University of Arizona, but also as the director of the Arizona State Museum. 
He has been a curator, an ethnohistory, a professor, a member of the graduate faculty, and many, many more things. I want to give a warm welcome to Dr. Michael Russian. Muy buenos dias. Good morning, distinguished members of the Diplomatic Corps, of the Honorary Committee, the Summit Committee, Summit Delegates, Collaborators, esteemed representatives of the Fundación Honoris Causa and the Consejo de Comunidades Hispanas, distinguished guests, one and all. I have the high honor and privilege of presenting to you the keynote address for the inaugural Diplomacy and Leadership Summit. I want to express las gracias profundas to the co-chairs of the summit, mi amigo Humberto Stevens and Genoveva Diaz, for their kind invite to deliver the keynote to such an august gathering of folks committed to the U.S.-Mexico friendship. We gather today and tomorrow to recognize the 200th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Mexico and the United States, the 50th anniversary of the Tucson Guadalajara Sister City Partnership, and significantly, our city of Tucson will receive the Campana Libertad Award, which is a replica of the Mexican Liberty Bell of 1810, and much like the US Liberty Bell of 1776, the Campana is a symbol of independence freedom, peace, and fraternity. The primary objective of a keynote address, as I see it, is to identify and give meaning to the broad themes of the summit, which are diplomacy, community and commerce, and even more crucially, to provide historical context to US-Mexico relations in what we, as summit participants, who exercise various forms of leadership from the local to international levels can learn from the U.S.-Mexico relationship and from bilateral cooperation. Conversely, we refrain from waxing eloquently in ways that romanticize what has often been a contentious historical relationship. As I remind my students at the University of Arizona, just as families, relationships, and friendships benefit and grow when they step back and take stock of where they have been in order to identify where they want to go, so too must those who are entrusted with promoting and refining the bilateral and multicultural relationship between Mexico and the United States. If modern history has taught us anything, if the early 21st century has taught us anything, is that we tend to seek immediate gratification from what happens today and tomorrow without exercising the virtues of patience and effort in order to cultivate and nurture the common good thoughtfully and respectfully. My first example of this represents neither Mexico nor the United States, but rather Middle Earth. Next slide. The fantasy world of the renowned author and scholar J.R.R. Tolkien and his first book, The Hobbit. After narrowly escaping death at the hands of the monstrous trolls, Thorin Oakenshield, leader of the company of dwarves, asked the wizard, Gandalf the Grey, who had just saved them, why he had disappeared earlier. Where did you go, if I may ask? To which Gandalf replied, to look ahead. Thorin quickly followed up with the second question, and what brought you back? Gandalf answered, looking behind. This summit presents an extraordinary opportunity to look back see common ground, and press forward ever so diligently, con cuidado y con mucho respeto. Next slide. Let's start by looking behind at difficult yet successful efforts at cooperation. 
1986, for example, when U.S. Treasury Secretary James Baker was privately predicting that the day is not far off when an American president is going to devote more time and attention to Mexico than the Soviet Union. He made those remarks during the twilight of the second phase of the Cold War, just before the Soviet Union collapsed, but a few years after Mexico had informed the United States and other international creditors of its inability to service its outstanding debt of approximately $80 billion, mostly dollar denominated. Next slide. Working tirelessly with Secretary Brady, the Federal Reserve, and the International Monetary Fund, Mexican Economic Minister Jesus Silva Herzog managed to defuse the debt bomb. Next slide. Less than a decade later, in January of 1987, Presidents Ernesto Cedillo and Bill Clinton worked together to ward off economic wreckage after the devaluation of the Mexican peso in late 1994, with Mexico repaying much earlier than expected the $13.5 billion emergency loan that it had received. It was a remarkable turnaround in Mexico's international financial credibility with ordinary Mexicans, yes, enduring hardships, and American politics weathering yet another polemic directed at its southern neighbor, its friend. Both of these financial crises, however, reminded Mexican and American diplomats and commercial interests of just how tightly integrated the two countries had become in the post-World War II period. Next slide. More recently, the financial metrics speak quite favorably of the U.S.-Mexico commercial relationship. Last year, in 2022, the total value of trade between the United States and Mexico amounted to about 780 billion U.S. dollars, a growth of 17% compared to the trade generated between the two countries in 2021. Of this $780 billion, U.S. exports made up $324 billion, an increase of over 17% from the previous year, while Mexican imports were worth $455 billion, a growth spurt of over 18% from 2021. Mexican goods represented 14% of the total imports that the United States received last year, while roughly 16% of total U.S. exports to the world were sent to Mexico. With this value of total trade, Mexico nearly always ranks as one of the top three largest trading partners of the United States, along with Canada and China, while the United States is Mexico's largest trading partner. These trade figures that emerge from the U.S.-Mexico relationship are particularly striking when you consider the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, supply chain disruptions, and stubborn inflation on global trade patterns overall. Next slide, please. The human dimension of the commercial relationship manifests in immigration. Mexican immigration to the United States officially began in 1848 when the international border was established. Although, as a historian, I must say, prior to 1848, diplomats and historians spoke of American immigration to Mexico, to places such as Tucson, Sonora, as we will see shortly. Immigration has continued to the present without any significant interruption, something that makes Mexican migration northward quite distinct as an essential component of the U.S. labor market. The immigration histories of national groups from Asia, Africa, and Europe were much more varied in trajectory and tempo. These usually began with massive movements driven by famine or political strife. Then they slowed, tapered off, or abruptly ended 
as was the case with Chinese immigration from 1850 to 1882. This aspect of global migration history helps explain why Mexico has been the largest source of immigrants in the United States for the longest period of time. While Mexicans remain the largest group of immigrants in the United States, accounting for about 24% of the 45 million foreign-born residents in the country as of 2021, their numbers have been shrinking for more than a decade. The COVID-19 pandemic seems to have slowed this decline somewhat, and the public health crisis also may have played a role in returning Mexicans to the top nationality for new arrivals, outpacing those from China and India for the first time in several years. In 2021, there were about 10.7 million Mexican-born individuals living in the United States, Despite the continued popularity of the U.S. as a destination, the Mexican immigrant population decreased by about 1 million, or roughly 9 percent, between 2010 and 2021. Between 05 and 2014, the number of Mexicans leaving the United States outpaced the arrival, the number of new arrivals, although this trend later reversed according to Pew Research Center estimates, with the number of Mexicans returning home in decline. For several years, starting in 2013, Mexico ceased to be the top country of origin for new immigrants in the United States, overtaken by India and China. However, as I mentioned, recent data suggest that during the pandemic, Mexicans have again become the largest new immigrant group amid widespread restrictions on nobility, particularly for people traveling long distances. Among U.S. foreign-born residents who in 2021 reported that they lived abroad a year before, 96,000 were Mexican as compared to 76,000 from India and 56,000 from mainland China. For about a year now, Mainstream and social media have focused on the record-breaking nature of the nearly two and a half million encounters, con comillas, no encuentros, at the U.S.-Mexico border in fiscal year 2022. But their preoccupation with this statistic overlooks the much bigger story that it tells us. Next slide. There is a hemispheric rather than simply a Mexican dimension to the ebb and flow of migrants and asylum seekers. And as a result, U.S. enforcement policies long directed toward arrivals from Mexico are misaligned, underscoring the need for new regional approaches. For the first time in North American history, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency encountered more Venezuelans Cubans and Nicaraguans during fiscal year 2022 than migrants from Central America. 2022 also saw significant new arrivals from Brazil, Ecuador, Haiti, the Ukraine, India, and Turkey. Failing to understand the complex story behind these trends not only stymies the development and implementation of policies, to better manage migration flows humanely, but it also misses the opportunity to inform the creation of regional relationships and policies that can address the new and shared realities of large-scale migration that increasingly begins much further south than Mexico or even northern Central America. The sociological reality, though, steep in our shared history is clear. The United States is overwhelmingly the most popular destination for Mexicans living abroad, accounting for 97% of all Mexican immigrants. In fact, 8% of all people born in Mexico lived in the United States as of 2020. But there is a wrinkle to this dynamic story, one that is over, often overlooked by the media in both countries. Non-Mexican heritage Americans are migrating to Mexico. 
In the last decade, Mexico has become the top nation for Americans to move to, a trend that spiked during the COVID-19 pandemic. There are now a record number of Americans becoming temporary residents in Mexico as of 2022. According to one analysis, there was an 85% increase between 2019 and 2022 in the number of Americans becoming temporary residents in Mexico. Americans are also choosing to move to Mexico because of the easy visa process compared to other countries. A majority of the expats flocking south work for U.S.-based companies, earn U.S. dollars, and can take advantage of a favorable exchange rate and don't need to go through the cumbersome process of requesting a visa if they plan to stay for 180 days or less. Some neighborhoods in Mexico City, such as Roma, La Condesa, and Coyoacan, are beginning to mirror gentrify areas in the United States, such as neighborhoods in Austin, Texas, Brooklyn, New York, and Miami, Florida. Admittedly, the migration of U.S. citizens to Mexico isn't new. Puerto Penasco, San Carlos, and Alamo, Sonora have had colonies of American retirees for quite some time as have many towns in Baja California, such as Ensenada, or in Baja California Sur, the towns of San Jose and Cabo San Lucas. What is new, though, is the demographic of Americans moving to Mexico. Next slide. More US citizens, usually understood to be digital nomads, have been able to work from Mexico get paid in U.S. dollars by their U.S.-based companies, and therefore stretch their paychecks. I have yet to see reliable numbers on these digital nomads, but I suspect that we are talking, at the moment, about several thousand, not millions, but several thousand. But many of these digital nomads do end up, or so it seems, in Endefe, in Mexico City, the federal district. Many Mexico City locals welcome the influx of outside visitors who stimulate the economy by spending their disposable income there. In the short span between January and April of 2022, international visitors spent over $850 million on hotels alone, according to tourism records. In fact, the mayor of Mexico City Claudia Schembaum partnered with Airbnb to increase the number of remote workers, these digital nomads, to come to the city. At the time, uh, the mayor dismissed concerns of rising rent prices, saying those who were coming were moving to areas where rent was already high. Contemporary phenomena such as the movement of Mexican migrant workers, American digital nomads, or cross-border medical tourists did not emerge in a vacuum, but rather owed their existence to deep historical forces, structures, and personalities. We commemorate the 200th anniversary of U.S.-Mexico relations. Next slide. We commemorate the 200th anniversary of, of the relationship between the two countries precisely because on December 12, 1822, the Mexican diplomat Jose Manuel Sosaya presented his credentials as envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary to the U.S. President James Monroe in the presence of the U.S. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams. In addition to establishing diplomatic relations, this act provided U.S. recognition of Mexico's independence from Spain, something that Mexico's leader at the time the emperor to be Agustin de Iturbide had wanted in an effort to secure a plum diplomatic victory. The origins of the first American diplomat in Mexico, however, provides a cautionary tale of the initial historical points of entry between the two countries. Next slide. Joel Poinsett arrived in Mexico in January of 1823 after President Monroe 
had appointed him minister plenipotentiary despite Poinsett's misgivings about Ikurvide's leadership. It was Minister Poinsett who set the tenor and tone of U.S. diplomacy in Mexico during those early years of the 19th century and foreshadowed the storm clouds that emerged under manifest destiny. That 19th century idea that the United States should extend its sovereignty from the Atlantic to the Pacific coasts. In American popular consciousness, though, Poinsett is remembered for having introduced La Flor de Noche Buena, the poinsettia, to the United States by removing several plants from Mexico and bringing them back. The poinsettia would come to symbolize the removal of Mexico's natural resources and the loss of half of its territory from the latter half of the 19th century to the early 20th century. Spring ahead, though, nearly 100 years later, on March 5th, 1947, when President Harry S. Truman was on the next to last day of a three-day whirlwind visit to Mexico. Departing from his prepared agenda, President Truman announced that he wanted to stop at Mexico City's historic Castillo de Chapultepec, Chapultepec Castle. As the presidential motorcade came to a halt by a grove of trees, President Truman stepped out of the car and walked over to a stone monument reading Niños Héroes. These were the six young military cadets who committed suicide by leaping from the castle battlements rather than surrender to the invading American troops during the Mexican-American War. President Truman laid a wreath on the monument and then, then stood for a few moments of silent reverence. All the while, a contingent of contemporary Mexican cadets, some with tears streaming down their cheeks, stood at rigid attention. Truman's action, duplicated 50 years later by President Bill Clinton, made Truman Mexico's all-time most popular U.S. president. One Mexico City newspaper headlined, Friendship began today, while another newspaper blazoned the message, rendering homage to the heroes of 1847, Truman heals an old national wound. One Mexican cab driver in Mexico City interviewed said, to think that the most powerful man in the world would come and apologize. Then the reporter interviewed a Mexican engineer who commented, 100 years of misunderstanding and bitterness wiped out by one man in one minute. This is the best neighbor policy. At a lunch later in the day, Mexican President Miguel Aleman proclaimed Truman, quote, the new champion of solidarity and understanding among the American republics. The American president's own comment was characteristically succinct, quote, Brave men do not belong to any one country. I respect bravery whenever I see it. So let's take a look at a very brief news clip from Truman's visit. In 1947, Harry Truman became the first U.S. president to ever visit Mexico City. Unexpectedly, Mr. Truman makes an out-of-the-way stop at the Chapultepec Monument. Here, he pays a simple tribute to the memory of Mexican youth who died 100 years ago defending their nation's capital against an American army. All Mexico was tremendously moved by this act. Truman brought to Mexico a promise. To observe the doctrine of non-intervention. What it means is that a strong nation does not have the right to impose its will by reason of its strength Upon a weaker nation. Next slide. So now let's leap to the year 2001. When Mary Ryan, the Assistant Secretary for Consular Affairs for the United States, remarked during the summer of 2001, quote, I would go so far as to say that this is the golden age of U.S.-Mexico relations. Now is the time to explore migration programs and contemplate creative solutions to the immigration polemic. On September 11th, however, 
Ryan's optimism gave way to a new geopolitical reality for the United States when terrorists attacked the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. So, is a golden age of U.S.-Mexico relations still out of reach? 13 years before the 9-11 attacks, in 1988, Jorge Castaneda, a former professor at UNAM and a future minister of foreign relations under President, uh, President Vicente Fox, and the late Robert Pasteur, a political science professor at American University in Washington, D.C., published a book, Limits to Friendship, in which they argued that even with well-intended efforts to communicate, Mexicans and Americans often speak across from each other, resulting more often than not in misunderstanding and confrontation. Both countries, both cultures, the authors argue, have to learn to curb their ethnocentrism and come to appreciate that language, customs, ideas, and habits differ between peoples and that one set of values is not necessarily superior to the other. Next slide, please. In fact, toward the end of his career, Matias Romero, sin duda Mexico's most effective ambassador to the United States in the 19th century, contemplated the relationship between the two countries. My experience has shown me that there are prejudices on both sides, growing out of want of sufficient knowledge of each other, which could be dispelled, and by doing so, a better understanding secured. Since 1822, when Minister Sosaya presented his diplomatic credentials to President Monroe, the United States and Mexico have been tested time and again. Invasions, occupations, civil wars, secessionist movements, multiple financial crises, global recessions, revolution, systemic racism, narco-violencia, they demand de drogas here in the United States. But each time the relationship emerged not quite the same, but not altogether different. Persistence and malleability accompany reaction and change. In the end, such efforts to find historical analogies are limited in their ability to explain change over time, which is what concerns historians like me. Because the context in which Mexico and the United States engage one another have changed and will continue to do so. 1822, 1822, of course, the year when the United States welcomed Mexico's first envoy to the White House, is not 2022. Next slide. When President Andres Manuel López Obrador met with President Joe Biden to discuss the bilateral relationship. Each year is distinct because each period witnessed its own complex interplay of politics, culture, and economy. Let us take our first steps, confidently so, into the next 200 years of U.S.-Mexico relations by identifying creative and responsible policies and solutions that are sensitive to and align with older, persistent questions, dare I say stubborn questions, that have eluded innovation and remain static and inert. I want to conclude my keynote by suggesting that the city of Tucson and its rich multicultural history inspires hope and points out why cooperation is much better than inertia. Next slide, please. I teach my students that Tucson's first democratic election took place on December 19, 1824, when the city was part of Mexico, and Los Tucsonenses elected by popular vote a civilian mayor, José León, who was independent of the military commander stationed at the Presidio. He took office on January 1, 1825. During his first month in office, Mayor Leon had to deal with livestock theft, disagreements between the various social groups, and threats of external attacks. When reading the mayor's very first informe to the Constituent Congress, I was struck and inspired 
by a seemingly mundane sentence. Every effort was made to calm the arguments and hard feelings so that peace might be restored on both sides. Mayor Leon recognized and had to deal with opposing viewpoints, multiple perspectives, cultural differences, and a new political and international reality. Tucson, Sonora, Mexico, no longer part of the Spanish Empire. An independent Mexico moved quickly to establish a republic, and Tucson's first democratic election had taken place a mere three months after the Constituent Congress was seated at El Fuerte Sinaloa, but nearly a year before a state constitution was passed and a corresponding state government could be established. In truth, the seeds of Tucson's democratic traditions were planted and nurtured in Mexican soil, despite the lack of a formal state government that could provide bureaucratic infrastructure. Furthermore, while Tucson and the vast Arizona-Sonora borderlands had always been multicultural, the region entered the international arena when three Americans, next slide, tres americanos, they were fur trappers, rode into town on New Year's Eve 1826. Although their names have not been identified, they were the first recorded Americans to visit our city. Tucson's third civilian mayor, Juan Romero, recorded their visit on January 2nd, 1827, noting, quote, three Americans appeared at this presidio to present their passports. They did so in obedience to a letter signed by our military commander, which the indigenous peoples, the Papagos, had presented to the Americans. At the time, in the early years following Mexican independence from Spain, there were concerns that illicit commerce and the arrival of foreigners would disrupt civil society. However, when you critically review the historical record, one finds balance and hope that personal relations and civil discourse could mitigate and reduce suspicion and instead promote amity. For example, Tucson's second mayor, Ignacio Pacheco, when he had met the American fur trappers along the banks of the Gila River before they had arrived in Tucson a few months later, he described the visitors in this fashion. Since the strangers seemed to be good people, I forbade them harm and encouraged others from harming them. Today, in the early 21st century, Mayor Pacheco's sentiment reminds us that civility, mutual respect, and giving our new neighbors the benefit of the doubt should always remain in fashion. Next slide, please. Tucson is also the first place in the U.S. to be honored with the designation City of Gastronomy. Why Tucson? Though UNESCO didn't formally explain its reasons for including the city in its network, it's obvious to many of us who call Tucson home that indigenous and Mexican foodways have sustained the rhythms of daily life desde el tiempo inmemorial. But what does this have to do with diplomacy and leadership? The primary objective of our summit is to identify common interests and move forward amicably. Think of the commercial and cultural opportunities that the designation provides Tucson in terms of burnishing its reputation as a leader in bi-national, bi-cultural, actually multicultural cooperation. Tucson is clearly a model of a gastronomy-based economy, and we can accelerate the exchange of best practices on how to support local producers and artisans, the development of cooperatives and public markets, urban food production, conservation, and distribution. Some of this has started, of course, but the commercial opportunities and cultural exchanges should push us forward, connecting, for example, Tucson and the Arizona Sonora borderlands to Ensenada in Baja California or Merida in the Yucatan. Both cities represent Mexico on UNESCO's roster of cities of gastronomy. 
This talk of exercising political, commercial, and even cultural leadership through food ways is not meant to distract us from the storm clouds that emerge from time to time in U.S.-Mexico relations. Let's be frank, but civil. The last few years have been tough for bilateral relations, but they have also been difficult for so many communities and families across Mexico and the United States. When the political rhetoric heats up, however, when the air is not yet clear, when poison polemic threatens to offend not only our intellectual sensibilities, but also threatens the stymie binational efforts to resolve our most pressing problems and challenges, I can think of no better way to mitigate such ill-tempered passions than to provide the sobering view of historical context. Next slide, please. I want to pose what might be called a framing question for our discussions today. Something for us to think about as we make our way through each component of the summit. And the question is inspired by three lines from one of my favorite poems, Robert Frost's Mending Wall. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. Before I built a wall, I asked to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I was like to give offense. The final line of the poem seems to suggest an answer. Good fences make good neighbors. So my question for all of you today, which one of these lines best encapsulates the direction you think U.S.-Mexico relations should take? Or perhaps we can create and add a new line, an innovation to this venerable poem, one that reflects our objectives, our dreams, and our promises to our communities. Next slide. Today, as the city of Tucson hosts the inaugural Diplomacy and Leadership Summit and receives the Campana de Libertad, may each of us become witnesses to discernment, earnest dialogue, and shared values that recognize the inherent dignity of every person, regardless of birthplace or upbringing. Enhorabuena, Tucson, por recibir la Campana de Libertad y que la amistad entre México y Estados Unidos perdure por los siglos de los siglos más allá de la proximidad geográfica y en cambio que perdure por ser vecinos fiables y estables. Many thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention this morning. I look forward to engaging in your ideas and learning from your professional experiences as well as learning from your material and cultural frames of reference. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Brescia. And uh, I was telling some of you, we're very lucky that we were able to get uh, Dr. Brescia to come here today, because I understand he's been taking one year off. It's a lot of PTO, but he deserves it. Uh, He's had many sabbaticals before, and I'm sure he's going to learn many new things that he can share with the community, not just in Arizona, but internationally. So again, Michael, thank you very much. <laughs> in the spirit of talking about action items, one of the things that we want to bring aboard, and this is from the Fundacional Nobis Casa, and Internacional as well, thank you. Miriam, bienvenida, bienvenida. Interjet Airlines. That's a hot topic because many of you had issues in the last few days, including the Mariachi Conference, to even get here. So we know the trip, right? If you go to Hermosillo, hopefully there's no problems, no road, or you go to Phoenix. So you're going to pay either way, out of pocket or you know, gas, whatever. But uh, Carlos invited. We've had some conversations, and hopefully we can board those conversations with the city at some point to bring an airline, to bring transportation to Mosillo, to Mexico City, finally. So I think that deserves an applause just for the attempt to do it. 
And with that comes to my, what I hold him near and dear to my heart as well, University of Arizona College of Elder, right? Elder College of Business Management, excuse me. The MBA program, they've done a lot, a lot for this program. The breakout stages we're gonna be going to were managed, created, they've gotten many of you, or all of them, for the panels. Luis, Barcelo, Javier. So I want to thank personally the UA delegate group that consists of UA Aller, SBS, College of Law, et cetera. If you could just give a round of applause, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> and to talk more succinctly and in depth about that, I'd like to bring up Ms. Liliana Feliz, who is the chair under Pam Perry, who is the honorary chair for U of A Elder College of Business Management. Thank you. support of Eller College of Management and all the fine delegates that joined the team and also the College of Law and, SV and the College of SBS. Thank you so much for all your time and dedication to the project. And can we give them a round of applause again? <laughs> so what we have done is we have uh, derived three main topics. Um, what we felt how we could shape our community, which is community, Commerce, which the other students will be working on, and um, diplomacy. So what we're hoping to do is take a holistic approach to be able to impact Pima County and also Mexico with the help of everyone here today and starting the conversation. Because that's where things start, is by having the right people at the conversation to be able to create social change. Uh, after we do this, uh, breakout session will also have a panelist discussion and then create a report. Uh, the Pima County Economic Development Team Director will be working hand in hand with our delegation to create a strategic report to present to you next year. Thank you. The conversations that we will be having right now, what we want is to build those collaborations, build future projects, and be able to turn those conversations into projects. I know you, many of you know, those that work within the government, that projects do take a really long time to happen. It is a lot of conversations, a lot of video calls, a lot of coffee meetups, and what we want is to be able to turn all of that into this is the phase one, this is when we start, this is the timeline, let's get ready. So with that, we're going to be dividing this room in three sections, that would be A, B, and C, and where we're going to be holding the round tables. Now the round tables will be moderated by individuals as well as uh, facilitated by our UA delegates. But in the diplomacy, which is going to be in section A, it's going to be moderated by Consul Rafael Durán.